Okay, good morning. My name is Gustavo Sampaio. I'm a journalist. I will try to moderate this next debate. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation. It's a, a great honor to be here today. I will start to introduce the, the speakers. Uh, first, uh, Renata van der Zee from the Netherlands, uh, who is a journalist, a writer, and a feminist activist. Uh, Pierre Anders Sunnesen, who is ambassador at large for combating trafficking in persons appointed by the Swedish government. Uh, Florence Montreno from France, who is uh, an historian and linguist and feminist activist, founder of the Zero Macho movement, Men Say No to Prostitution. Uh, Huska Mao from Germany, who is a survivor and founder of the activist group Netzwerk uh, Hella. And Sara Vicente Colado from Spain, a lawyer and activist coordinator of projects in the Commission for the Investigation of Mistreatment of Women in Spain and connected to the European lobby as well. Okay. Uh, I have to follow some rules in this debate. There will be two rounds of questions and each speaker will have uh, five minutes to, to answer. But first we'll listen to Renata van der Zee who has a written speech. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is, uh, what is the practice in your country? Yes, yes, yes. And how do you assess it? So we'll start with Renata van der Zee. After these two rounds of questions, we'll start the debate with the audience. Um, I'd like to explain something about the situation in Holland. In 2000, the Dutch government de decided to legalize prostitution. And the aim was good. It was to improve the position of women in prostitution and to combat human trafficking, illegal prostitution, and prostitution of minors. Practically, this mean meant that the old ban on brothel keeping was lifted. It became possible to legally run a brothel. If the owner applied for a license, and complied with a number of rules, of which the most important ones was that he was not allowed to employ underage girls and undocumented women. The brothel keepers were submitted to regular controls by the police. The philosophy behind this measure was that you could divide the sex industry into two different worlds, the world of forced prostitution and the world of free prostitution. Of course, the world of forced prostitution was considered problematic and the Dutch wanted to seriously address it by a law against human trafficking. But the so-called free prostitution was seen in the Netherlands as something one should not be moralistic about. It was considered to be the woman's choice and one believed that women should be free to make that choice. According to the Dutch government, it should be considered a form of work. The Dutch thought that, their, uh, that the legalization of prostitution was a pragmatic approach. Prostitution was considered unavoidable, and the best thing one could do was to try to reduce the harmful aspects of this. By legaling, legalizing brothel keeping, regulating it, and submitting it to regular inspections the Dutch wanted to, to create a clean prostitution sector where women could work freely, unhampered by pimps. The idea was that if prostitution would be normalized and considered as work, the stigma around it would vanish and the women would become independent, self-employed sex workers who paid taxes. They would become entrepreneurs who could fend for, men, for themselves and pimps would simply disappear because the women wouldn't need them anymore. That's really what was said. This change in policy was advocated by left-wing parties and by feminists who maintained that women have the right to do with their bodies whatever they want. 
But these people were completely blind for the fact that most women in prostitution are extremely vulnerable and they cannot do with their bodies what they want simply because the pimps won't allow them. Now the Dutch system was based on many false assumptions. This caused the Dutch Minister of Internal Affairs, Lodewijk Archer, to remark years later, we have been reprehensible na naive when we legalized prostitution. The first false assumption was that one could make the division of forced prostitution on the one hand and free prostitution on the other hand. The overwhelming majority of the women in prostitution are neither changed, chained to the bedpost nor happy hookers. They belong to the vast gray area of women who are tricked or manipulated into prostitution, often because previous experiences of domestic or sexual violence or homelessness have made them extremely vulnerable. One cannot simply say we are going to combat the world of forced prostitution and clean up the world of free prostitution because there cannot be such a distinction. There are no two different worlds. It's one sex industry and within it everything is intertwined. Secondly, obliging brothel keepers to obtain a license and submitting them to rules and police controls does not do away with pimps. Human trafficking can easily continue in spite of police controls. It's easy to check if a woman has a passport if she's not underage, but it's very difficult to prove that she's in the hands of a pimp, and she is certainly not going to tell a police officer when this is so. So, after the legalization in Holland, pimps simply continued their activities, and they did it in legal window prostitution. Brothel keepers who didn't want to obtain a license and stick to all kinds of rules, they disappeared underground in illegal prostitution. And that's the third problem with Dutch legalization. It only applied to brothel keepers with a license, but it, it did nothing to address unlicensed prostitution, which is according to the Dutch police a growing sector. What the Dutch wanted to do was impossible. You cannot create a clean prostitution sector. You cannot normalize prostitution, simply because the act of paying for sex can never be normal. It is an expression of deep inequality between women and men, poor and rich, and black and white. You cannot normalize this inequality, just like you cannot normalize slavery. The sex industry is an industry where an incredible amount of money is to be made. This will always attract organized crime. You can't beat organized crime by legalizing the brothels in which they operate. In fact, legalization has made things easier for organized crime. They can simply put their women in legalized brothels with a license, license and exploit them at will. All they need to do is ensure the women are not underage or undocumented. It's easy. It happens all the time in the Dutch sex industry. Now, the Dutch believed that their approach was pragmatic, but in reality, it was based on an idealistic image, a fantasy of the situation of women in prostitution. It totally underestimated the power of organized crime in the sex industry, it did nothing to reduce any harm whatsoever. After almost 20 years after the legalization, there have been several government and police reports that has, have shown that, that this approach did not improve the position of women in prostitution and did nothing to diminish human trafficking. There is a general consensus now in the Netherlands that the legalization has been a failure. Since 2008, the government has been discussing a new prostitution law because the leg legalization simply hasn't worked. When Amnesty International advocated the total decriminalization of prostitution in the summer of 2016, the Dutch National Rapporteur on Human Trafficking criticized the human rights organization, saying that there is no proof that legalization of prostitution is an effective policy. 
A recent survey of the Dutch organization SOA AIDS has shown that 90% of the people in Dutch prostitution experience violence. A recent report of the Amsterdam Court of Auditors concluded that human trafficking still occurs regularly in the red light district of Amsterdam. That's the reality of legalization. Amsterdam is still an important destination for human traffickers and legalization did not do anything to change that. In fact, there are experts who believe that human trafficking has grown since the legalization. Thank you. Now I pass the word to Mr. Sunnison to speak about the, the situation in Sweden and the, the, the system of public policies in, in Sweden regarding to the prostitution phenomena. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, happy to be here. Uh, yes, I was appointed uh, ambassador against human trafficking uh, in May 2016. It's a new function within the Swedish government. We have a feminist government that I'm representing, and they felt a strong need to have someone representing the government within uh, the work that's been done within the UN system and uh, within EU, and also to, to have uh, bilateral discussions with other countries regarding human trafficking. And I've been asked to especially focus on human trafficking for sexual exploitation. And as it, it turns out, this is what I've been actually doing for these two and a half years now, focusing on, on the issue of prostitution, because it's, for me and for my, for my government, it's totally clear that we will never, never combat, be able to combat human trafficking for sexual exploitation um, and win that battle if prostitution is being allowed in countries. So, yes. So uh, I want to quote what my gender equality minister said in the UN last year during a, uh, during a debate in the Security Council. She said that sexual uh, prostitution is always sexual exploitation. It could never ever be considered a job. So I've been asked to say, uh, say something about the Swedish system and um, most of you are probably familiar with it, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway because it's important. There are some, you know, uh, some. Um, there's been things said about the consequences of the uh, the legal system in Sweden that's just not right. But I want to start by taking you back to uh, early 70s and the 80s in Sweden. Uh, back then, prostitution was not. Uh, criminalized in Sweden, and uh, the issue of prostitution was really not discussed in the Swedish society. But we did have a big discussion about men's violence against women and gender inequality. And th this was a really huge pro problem in Sweden. And the women's movement, because it's always the women's movement who are pushing for these issues, they were really you know, angry, telling our government, you need to look into this, you need to look into this. And the government did what government usually do. They put together a governmental inquiry to look into the structures behind gender equality, to look into the structures behind, behind men's violence against women. And during these inquiries, the issue of prostitution came up because it was clear evidence that, uh, that, uh, that uh, allowing uh, men to buy women's bodies were not you know, promoting gender equality. Uh, there was a lot of connections with men's violence against women and so on. So the women's movement went back to the Swedish government and said, hey, you need to look into prostitution because this seems to be a really big problem in Sweden. And the government did what governments do. They put together another governmental inquiry to look into prostitution. And they did a really thorough job. They, they um, interviewed most of those women who were in prostitution in Sweden back then. This, you know, this is a long time ago. And they also interviewed the, the buyers. And the results, well, I would say that 99% of the girls who were in prostitution in Sweden back then were Swedish girls. And 99% of them could testify that they'd been abused 
through, to, through childhood. There were serious problems within their families. Many of them had run away and so on. So it was really easy to conclude that almost everyone was in some term a victim, a victim of, of their upbringing. And looking at the interviews from the Johns were really scary reading because it was like, you know, this is the right for me as a man to have sex and I don't have a girlfriend, I don't have a wife, and someone has to, you know, take care of my needs. Um, my wa wife don't want to do what I want to do, so, so I should be, uh, I should be, um, should be, I should be able to buy this. And actually, we're doing these ladies or girls a favor because they are lazy, they don't want to do anything else. And yeah, th this was kind of the, the results from the interviews. And these results were made public, and it was a big out outcry in the Swedish soci society regarding this. And the issue of prostitution really was discussed. And, and people are saying, is this the kind of society we want to live in? Is this the kind of society we want our children to live in? And I would say the, the majority of the public opinion was that no, we don't want a society where we allow prostitution. And the government said, we agree. So the next issue was, okay, so should we criminalize both the buyer and the person who is selling his or her body? And there were arguments for, both model, uh, for, for that model but a lot of people were raising their voices, remembering the results from the inquiry. Almost everyone in prostitution could be considered being a victim. Sh is it correct to punish them again? No. Let's just criminalize the buyer. Let's put the shame where it belongs on the person who is using someone else's vulnerability for his own needs and instead provide exit possibilities, support to the person who is in prostitution. So this was the decision of the Swedish government. And of course, there was a lot of debate going on bef be before this, and people were saying it's going to become more dangerous uh, to, to be in prostitution and so on. But we have evaluated the law, and I don't know if that's the next question, Mr. Um, uh, Yes, moderator. Uh, the results and the evaluation, would that be the next question? Yeah, that's the next question. So I'll say that. But let me just say that we have had this legislation in Sweden now. F we had this uh, legislation in Sweden for many years now, and we are very happy with the way it turned out in Sweden. And I must say, traveling the world now for two and a half years, I am I just don't understand any longer how prostitution can be allowed by, by governments when we have an agreement on Agenda 2030 to stop violation of women, to stop violation of children, and so on. There are so many good arguments to stop this. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Huska Mao uh, from Germany and from the movement Netzwerk uh, Vela. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a prostitution, survivor of prostitution from Germany and um, I was told we were asked two questions and we have 10 minutes of time. I will um, answer the first question within three minutes and the next in the second round in um, seven minutes. And uh, to make sure it's exactly te 10 minutes because I'm from Germany and we are very much into <laughs> punctuality, <laughs> I wrote it all down. <laughs> okay, the first question was, what is the situation um, in Germany? And in Germany, prostitution, was never prohibited. Uh, it was always legal, but it was deemed counter to good morals um, that is harmful to the community. Therefore, prostituted women couldn't legally insist on their payment. In 2000, a court for an administrative matters agreed in a lawsuit with Felicitas Shiro and Stephanie Klee, two brothel keepers, 
that prostitution must no longer be counted as counter to good, to good morals. As a result, the German Prostitution Act came into effect in 2002. The law means a type of legalization and was pushed for by a sex industry lobby mostly comprised of the associations Hydra, the Berufsverband Erotische and Sexuelle Dienstleistung, that is a profes professional association for erotic and sexual services, and the organization of brothel keepers, the Professional Association for Sexual Services, Berufsverband Sexuelle Dienstleistungen. The implementation of the law and some regulations and further laws on redefining pimping and human trafficking for the purpose of prostitution was left to case law, that is individual court cases and to the lender, the different German states, and there mostly to the municipalities within a framework of the general law, which also mandates that cities larger than 50,000 inhabitants must designate areas for prostitution and brothel keeping. The various municipalities also decide on taxes they want to collect from prostitution, that is from the brothels and above all from the prostitutes. The law's purpose was to make prostitution safer for the women in it, to make it possible for them to take the buyers to court over non-payment and to ensure they would be able to enter regular health and social insurance services. This was not achieved. Only 44 women in Germany, 44 from 400,000, entered the regular state social security system. The number of murders of prostituted women is very high and Germany has become a sex tourism destination. There has been a massive increase in the number of prostituted women between 400,000 and 1 million, but we don't know exactly how many there are. What we do know for sure is that over 1 million men in Germany visit a brothel each day. In 17, there has been an additional law, the Prostitutes Protection Act. Prostitution is still legal, but subjected to significantly tighter regulations. These regulations mainly target the prostituted women. So we have the strange situation in Germany that prostitution is legal, but prostituted women are still criminalized. And they can be arrested when they prostitute in, a, in the wrong place. As before, pimping is only illegal, illegally, illegal if it is deemed exploitative, and that means if the pimp keeps more than 50% of a prostituted woman's earnings. Regarding forced prostitution, there are no legal prosecutions without the victim's statement. It is also up to the vic victim to prove the coercion or force which leads to very few sentences, about 350 a year. So this is the situation in Germany. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Sara Vicente from Spain, where the government is debating the possibility of uh, applicating the Nordic model. And we have that actuality um. Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting us uh, to participate in this uh, European conference with such uh, broad and valuable representation uh, from each of the countries of legal activists uh, to achieve a society free of prostitution and trafficking of women and girls uh, for the purpose of sexual exploitation. In, uh, in Spain, uh, institutional policies uh, have been erratic uh, since the criminal uh, code uh, was am amended in uh, 1995. Um, this is the situation uh, in the in the Spain is uh, legalized uh, the, the prostitution. Um, 
and um, discriminalizing uh, lucrative pimping and making a legal distinction between voluntary and forced prostitution is the situation in Spain. Uh, in Spain. Uh, the, the legalize uh, distinct between voluntary and forced prostitution. <laughs> um, this modification of the penal regulation means uh, that the, Spain, the, uh, the Spanish state uh, failed fail to comply with the international commin, uh, commin, commin means subscribe uh, and incorporated into the inter internal regulation. Uh, the Convention of uh, 1949, uh, the CEDAW uh, and successivos uh, convenius, uh, conventions, uh, it was forced to modify, case, modify the penal code and, uh, on three oca occasions. The less, uh, at least, party uh, in the years uh, 20, bueno, 203, 210, and 215, without succeeding uh, in uh, any of these modifications uh, to retake the abolitionist penal legislation that uh, we have and from uh, 1973 to 1995 uh, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, what is the, the problem? The problem uh, is um, this uh, cita is, uh, is in Spanish. Uh, is a problem. The problem is the, um, the consequence of the, this modification have uh, been multiply, multiply and have uh, given this rise to a dispersion of regulations and public policies in our country at local, uh, regional and state levels. Uh, while trafficking uh, for the purpose uh, of sexual exploitation has a cons uh, consensus uh, of uh, rejection in all species. There is a tendency to equate trafficking uh, with for prostitution and uh, to separate uh, so-called volunteer prostitution from trafficking as if uh, they were two distinct and unrelated uh, phenomena. Uh, there is a tendency to consider uh, that all forms of trafficking are equal and the, there is no distinction on the grounds of, ger of genders or the specified T of the subject matter, thus equating, equating prostitution with labor exploitation. There is the, the tense, uh, is the culture of prostitution. Uh, there is the tendency to adopt norms that attempt to organize and regulate prostitution instead of uh, consider, considering it one form of violence against women, thus normalizing the phenomenon of, of prostitution and prostitutional uh, relationship. Uh, there is a social consideration that prostitution is uh, one choice for women, uh, speaking of sexual freedom rather than uh, sexual violence against women. women. Uh, the, the demand uh, has the right to ex exercise its sexual freedom and the purchase of sexual service is totally uh, normal normalized and integrated uh, as an equal relationship between two persons 
free and equal in rights. The man uh, who demands prostitution uh, service and the woman who is forced into prostitution. Uh, this is the National Association of uh, Local uh, of Alterne in my country and your objectives uh, for Socialite, uh, it's, it is considered uh, moralist uh, to understand prostitution as a form of sexual violence and it is considered that the only way to grant rights to women in prostitution is to define, is to define prostitution as work. Those uh, who stigmatize, stigmatize women in prostitution and really act against women's rights are not the men uh, who demand prostitutional relation in the framework of a macho society, but the abolitionist feminist. All uh, this makes prostitution institutionality considered a choice uh, for women because uh, the their sexual freedom. Um, the situation in Catalonia, uh, in the north of the, of the country, this is fundamentally uh, the level of the current debate, debate in Catalonia and in other sectors uh, linked to the most political uh, and socially transgressive left. Transgressive left. Uh, in, Catalon in Catalonia, the regulation of prostitution uh, has been organized uh, and structured uh, for mm, decades. In uh, 201, an, autonom an, an autonomous decree was approved for the regulation of the activity of, prost of prostitution and local uh, public concurrence which uh, also uh, challenged, challenged uh, by the abolitionist uh, women's organization, the Spain's, my organization uh, is uh, one of the, this organization, uh, the, uh, to the Spanish courts, incomprehensiblemente, incomprehensibly, um, gave carte blanche allowing, uh, allowing it to have effect at present against uh, all international regulation that uh, have a preferential uh, char uh, uh, character. The Spanish uh, um, Colau, mayor of Barcelona, is uh, in, in this moment, in this moment, is offering uh, and paying for courses uh, to teach novice women to practice prostitution by the hands of APROSEX, uh, the organization uh, behind the, crea the, crea the, cre the creation of the Union of Sex Workers Others, recent, uh, recently legalized by the Directorate General of Labor. Yes. In Catalonia. Okay. So yes. how come you said that in Spain they are considering the Swedish model? The the national government uh, ah, nationwide. Yes. And, and, yes. and it's but, but you it said that, that, it, that in Spain the thinking is still uh, is local uh, is local government. Is a uh, uh, mayor of the Barcelona. It's an early phase of the debate. It's, it, it's an early phase of the debate. It's only a, an intention of the government to debate the, the possibility of introducing the, the Nordic the model.
no, no problem. Um, with this legislation uh, that normalized prostitution, Catalonia is uh, becoming the brother of the Europea, Europe, Europe uh, along with Germany and Holland. In La Junquera, uh, a town of the border uh, with France, exist the large brothers of uh, South Europe. Uh, full of young French men. The mayor of the La Junquera has said uh, that she cannot uh, renown the income that the prostitution industry brings uh, to her municipality indirectly. Uh, they consume uh, in supermarkets gasol, uh, gasol tobacco, al alcohol, and in restaurants. This is uh, the only thing that matters. Uh, women's well be, uh, will be, uh, bueno, well being, dignity and achieving equality do not matter. Ma matter. The situation, uh, political situation uh, of parties, political parties uh, between PSE, Partido Socialista, eh, eh, no, Partido Comunist, eh, Comunist eh, Parties and EU are uh, those parties uh, with uh, abolitionist, uh, abolitionist political position on prostitution. Uh, the only uh, thing that uh, they do not defend is the penalize, uh, penalization of the demand. Of the demand. Be, uh, between on uh, one education, uh, educational approach before initiating uh, any punitive action. Uh, the socialist uh, parties, like the rest uh, of the political parties, uh, step, uh, best, uh, communist parties and EU, uh, does not have an express, uh, uh, expressly, expressly, expressly abolitionist political position, although uh, in the last electoral campaign in half uh, clear abolitionist actions. Uh, popular parties and Podemos uh, parties, parties uh, have not poli no political Posture nor abolitionist programmatic definition. Ciudadanos Party uh, have, have political position uh, is on the regulation of prostitution, just like uh, subrogated uh, worms. This is the uh, situation, uh, prostitution. 20. Uh, mm -hmm. The demand is between 27 and bueno, 27 and 39 uh, percent. Spain is destination of sex tourism. So, thank you, Sara Vicente. Now, last but not least important, uh, Florence Montreno from France and from Zero Macho Movement. Mm, hola. <laughs> I recently read the book of your famous writer, Pessoa, the Libro of Desasosego. I remember this sentence. I'm not pessimist, I'm sad. So I will say I'm not optimist, I'm so to say gay. <laughs> so I hope to bring a little hope now after this so sad things you said. So the question was what we did in France. So since April 16, France enforced the law against the system of prostitution inspired by the Swedish model. The people in prostitution are no longer considered as delinquents, but as victims to whom the state must offer support and a way out, exit, as you precisely name it. 
the revolutionary characteristic, the only one that journalists and public paid attention to, is penalizing punters for an act of prostitution. These men, but I prefer to call them prostitutes, since customers or clients is, uh, offers only an economic analysis of prostitution that is the system of violence and not economic. So these men are pulled out of the shadow for the first time in France. This law makes these men responsible for the system of prostitution because without demand there will be no supply. Without these millions of men ready to pay for a sex act, there wouldn't be any human beings traffic in prostitution. The prescribed penalty is quite light. It's a contravention, only 350 euro in practice. And in addition to the fine, the offender must also undergo a training to raise awareness of the struggle against buying sex acts which should, I quote, should remind the offender what are the realities of prostitution and the consequences of the mercantilization of bodies. It also intends to make the offender aware of his penal and civil responsibility of his act. The penalty of prostitutes is revolutionary because it's a total reversal of direction in an history scared by indulgence regarding male violence. Until the 19th century, France, like many other countries, alternated in the whole centuries, alternated between repression of prostitution and a larger or smaller tolerance. But with our great Napoleon, the regulation of prostitution reached a never seen centralized organization which earned it the name of French system, just like the so-called Swedish system today, which opened the way for a radical change. The French system, so-called, established from, nine, from 1802, an organized prostitution with, between, uh, within the establishments of tolerance, where women are provided to men who pay. These women are called filles soumises, submissive girls. Submissive tells a lot. And are opposed to filles insoumises, rebellious girls that hook in the streets and are chased by the police. In exchange for a few concessions to morality, like the obligation to have uh, windows closed and that gain the name maison close, closed houses, Francis Thus organizes sexual slavery of poor women forced to submit to medical controls while the prostitutes are not. This system lasts until 1946, when the so-called Martrichard law abolished it in the country, but not in the French colonies, where the abolition will only be enforced in 1960. This means military brothels are legal and soldiers in the colonial wars of Indochina and Algeria were entitled to them. Why 1960? That's the year when Francis ratifies the Abolitionist Convention of 1949. From 60 onwards, France is officially abolitionist. That means prostitution is free, only pimping is repressed. In reality, it depends on the behavior of local police officers towards people in prostitution, the instruction they are given, and the powers they feel entitled to. We have to wait to 2002. That's the key year. The law named after the minister, the then minister Sarkozy, creates the crime of passive soliciting, which is a contradiction in itself. The people who solicit in the streets without doing anything, only being so in the streets, are liable to uh, fines, imprisonment, and in fact, a few women were imprisoned. I was so ashamed 
to be French that day, that first day, that an, a refugee from Kosovo was imprisoned while the tens of men that, that have, uh, had um, a, um, a felation were, were in, the, in their beds. I was so ashamed to be French. And we, we revolted, we the feminists in France. This repressive law is a turning point in France. On the 10th of December 2002, answering a call of the National Collective for the Rights of Women, thousands of activists, including uh, us, protest in Paris. The event makes history. It's the first time in the world that so many feminists protest against prostitution Another unprecedented event is that men were about the quarter of the total. So it was since 2002 a long march, a very long march to achieve a law after the Swedish model. After this, and it was an unpredictable success in 16. During all those years, and for some activists like me long before 2002, it's all almost 30, year for 30 years for me, many of us acting without any hope of ever seeing such a law being passed, mostly because French society shows complacency towards prostitution, considered as a necessary evil. It's called the oldest profession of the world. Do you know that it's totally wrong because the oldest feminist profession is midwife. The prejudice about men needs, men's needs are firmly ingrained, just as the awful justification that like it keeps men from raping, and the fake compassion from women in prostitution who would be warmer in the boat brothel. There's another French particularity unknown in the Nordic countries, the image featured in films and songs about the reputation of seductive French women provides for a joyful and light image of prostitution and it associated to male enjoyment with a bit of transgression against middle class hypocrisy. It is this transgressive image that is still today cultivated by renowned men, intellectual or artists, when they boast about buying sex as a proof of their nonconformism. They add the power of their celebrity to a virulent lobby of pimps whose arguments go from ad hominem attacks against us abolitionists classified as, as a bunch of frustrated Catholics <laughs> to individual claims presenting prostitution as a chosen job. When facing such a coalition that, at, that had attracted most of the media attention, the abolitionist collective did not have much weight at first. And yet, a series of auspicious factors joined and we were successful in passing the law. As an historian, I was fascinated to see that our success and I tried to analyze it, I tried it to, to give you arguments because I, I describe the conditions that uh, for me are necessary to gain. So uh, it's on the state sites of web zero macho, it's at, at least at length, at will, I will say only the main. So the, at least at five factors, at least, and the, without the first, you'd never gain. The first is a political engagement. You need somebody to carry the law, to, to attach his, his or her, in France it was her name, to this law, and to be very, very perseverant for years. Second condition, the constitution of a collective of association. In France we had a collective. Uh, some, sometimes they were specialized in helping prostitution, uh, women in prostitution, the other being generalist feminist. But you need a great force collaborative. And in France, we are lucky enough to have the majority, the vast majority are abolitionists. We're also already abolitionists. Third action, 
third condition, the action of women like you and Rachel and the women without exited, prosti exited prostitution, and we have, we, who have witnessed the interesting, interesting violence of prostitution. We need them. It's in France, we had Rosen Hischer, who led a march of 740 kilometers in order to convince MPs of the urgency of voting in favor of the law. It was a determined event. Fourth condition in France, uh, but I think it might be, and it has never been said uh, as I heard today, the contribution of doctors who witnessed the physical and mental state of women in prostitution. And five, fifth condition, we were very helped by rich and famous prostitutes. First, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, director of the IMF. <laughs> Thank you to him. And second, we have two very well-known football or soccer players, Franck Ribéry and Karim Benzema. They were relaxed after having paid for sex to a 17 years girl, the old girl, also prostitution of a minor was already punished by law at that time. So we gained a lot of attention because people w were horrified to hear about that. What was that our friend in the, in, in the street in Paris? Uh, you were supposed to ask me <laughs> something, something, practical steps to achieve results? Shall I say that? Uh, yes. you, you have to be quick, please. Okay, <laughs> that's, uh, I have to be quick. Okay, it's only mm, a minute. What practical steps can be taken to achieve results? Now it's the, the last part of the, of the job to be done, and it's, according to me, it's the most important, because the law is nothing, because a law unemployed is dangerous. Not even useless, but dangerous. We should therefore monitor the enforcement of the law, which means, first, ensure there is always a budget concerning the provisions of the law. Second, contact the people in charge, the administrative directors of the ministries and local councils that, that each French department has a relevant commission to study the cases of persons who want to leave prostitution. Third, interpolate the ministries of justice and interior so that police officers do really chase the prostitutes. In two years, 2,000 contraventions were made in only four French departments. We have hundreds of departments. In two years, 2,000 um, contraventions, it's more than Sweden in 15 years. And it worked because men are afraid. It's very good. Another, ensure the training of the new gener generation of police officers and public servants related to justice as well as social workers. And last, ensure the integration of questions relating to the prevention of prostitution in sexual education program at school. It's all in the law, but it must be enforced. And as for us activists, we will continue the pedagogical work to overcome the cliche about male needs and the increased secu security of brothels. There is still a lot of work to be done, but one essential thing is achieved. The law established the principle that the pimps and the prostitutes are the only ones to be condemned, while people in prostitution must be helped to exit. At last, a clear vision of this phenomenon of world oppression. We own this clarity to Sweden because in this case, the light came from the north. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Swedish people who have served humanity so brilliantly. Thank you. So we have uh, not much time to this second round. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Well, I explained how, how it didn't work in Holland. Can you use the, the, the microphone? Please? I already explained how it didn't work in Holland, so. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll try to make some quick questions for this second round, and you can answer uh, with the microphone. And then I'll let Hushka Mao, who has a written yeah. uh, presentation to the end. 
and we have to be very quick. So, uh, Renata van der Zee, I, I'll ask you uh, how do those public policies regarding prostitution uh, are connected with uh, gender equality policies? How, oh yeah. how do they connect? That's a great, uh, that's a great question. Because um, in Holland, uh, boys grow up with the idea that prostitution is something uh, that you, you, know, you can use. And uh, of course, this has a detrimental effect on the equality between men and women. And the fact that you have areas with window prostitution, this really attracts men. And it also attracts men into prostitution that maybe initially didn't really want to go and visit a woman in prostitution, but they are, you know, they're sort of uh, taken there with their friends. And, and the fact that we have this open uh, legalized window prostitution is an invitation for men. And also the government, by legalizing prostitution, is saying to the people of Holland, uh, we see a prostitution as something inevitable, uh, we want, we, we think it could be something normal. And so actually uh, the exploitation, the sexual exploitation of women I is, is seen as something that you can normalize. Well, it's very obvious what that does to the relation between men and women. And mind you, many people think that we, Holland, are a Scandinavian country. That's not true. <laughs> And, and when it comes to feminism, we don't, we cannot stand in the shadow of the Scandinavian countries. And uh, I mean, feminism is, is something which is not very big in Holland and abolitionism is very small. So uh, yeah, it has a bad impact on uh, the relation between men and women. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sunison, you, you saved some part of your answer back there. Do you well want to answer now? Or do you want to speak about um, the movements from civil society who were involved in the in the process in Sweden to implement uh, the Nordic model? Well, I as you wish. I think I promised the audience that I would say something about the consequences of the Swedish law, uh, and uh, I told you that it came into force 1999, and that there was a debate regarding would this make it more dangerous for those in prostitution and, and other things. And uh, we've done a couple of evaluations. First, I want to say that when the law came into force, it was about 50-50 in the Swedish society uh, pro and against the law. Today, it's uh, more than 80% are uh, pro the law. Uh, regarding if it became more dangerous, we haven't had one violent crime reported to someone in prostitution since the law came into force. And when I was appointed, I asked the Swedish police if I could go out and work with them for a couple of nights. And we were discussing, discussing the legislation and they said, you know, first we thought this was very strange, just, uh, just uh, uh, arresting one of the two parties. But today we think this law is, is great because it really made it you know, more easy for us to establish contact with the person who is in prostitution. They are no longer afraid to talk to us. They are no longer afraid to talk to social workers. And thanks to that, we have uh, been able to uncover s several uh, organized crime syndicates regarding uh, prostitution and so on. Did it become more violent? Well, if I were to go out in, uh, or more dangerous, if I were to go out and buy sex in Sweden today, I would be so afraid that someone would find out because the mindset of Swedish people really changed. You know, very few think it's okay to buy sex. So if I were to do that, I would be so afraid that someone would find out because I would lose my face, I would lose my job, right? And I would go to jail. Mm. So I would absolutely not do anything to make locomotions regarding this. I would not you know, fight with the person I was buying sex from or try to steal or cheat money from him or her. Because I know she or he could call the police right away and they would come and arrest me. Another uh, fact about, uh, about the law I is that right away when the law came into force, the street prostitution was diminished with more than 50%. And it has diminished even more since then, a lot more. And 
Someone, some people would argue, well, this was about the same time internet came, into uh, came in and the prostitution moved inside anyway. Well, we've done evaluations comparing ourselves to other countries. Uh, and uh, there are very, very small numbers of prostitution going on in Sweden. S and so it really, you know, the mindset, that's maybe the most important because the demand for girls, women, because that's mostly girls and women, is very small in Sweden. And there are numerous reports showing that we do not have a big problem with organized crime, trafficking for sexual in, uh, exploitation to Sweden because the market is considered dead in Sweden. And uh, we just heard about Germany, and Germany, the figures I have, that's about 400,000 girls, women in prostitution in Germany. And the, the figure I've heard is uh, that 98%, I saw the 95% too, 98% to 95% are girls from other countries, from Macedonia, Moldavia, Romania, and so on. So, you know, the German brothels are not, uh, <laughs> it's not German women who choose to work in these brothels. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's always the most vulnerable who end up working, working at the brothels. So, so for Sweden, this served us well. We don't have a huge demand for, for for, for prostitution in our country, and we do not have a lot of problems with organized crime for this. And uh, does Swede not go abroad and buy sex? Yes, yes they do. We have Swedish people <laughs> travel abroad. And that's very hard to investigate how many, but I would say that a lot fewer than I if uh, there was a view in the society that it's okay to buy sex. And I'm turning 55 next week. In my generation, yes, there are still men in my age that maybe thinks it would be okay to do this. My son, he's 27, and I'd say that very, very few people in Sweden in that generation thinks it's, would even consider buying someone else's body. Thank you. Um, can, can I can I ask a question, Per? Yes. Uh, quick, because quick. Um, and like you say, you have uh, you have not many cases of human trafficking in Sweden, mm -hmm. but that could also be because you are not uh, the Swedish police is not uh, putting f uh, a lot of effort in uh, in trying to find them. Because actually, I uh, in my country where we have a system which is not so favorable. We, how, uh, nevertheless, we have a lot of energy being put in uh, in researching human trafficking. So, I mean, uh, I love your story, but I think it's a bit of a fairy tale, too much. Mm. Uh, well, I don't agree. Uh, I think that from time to time, yes, there has been a discussion about how much effort the police uh, are putting into this. But we do have national teams that are working in the big cities, and they are working you know, to educate and support police officers in, in other cities. And I would say that our migration uh, authority also is really up on this issue. So yes, of course, more can be done. But I would say that this is a priority for the Swedish police. And if you read in their report, they will say it's a priority. Okay. But more can be done, absolutely. And how many, uh, how many uh, women in prostitution are estimated to work in uh, Sweden? I think it was three years since the last mm -hmm. countdown was, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a couple of hundreds back then, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, so as compared to 20,000, 25,000 in Holland. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a small country, really, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. But I agree, I mean, I, I just want to say that, that uh, no, but the thing is, you know, uh, if we want to add, if we want to do really uh, promote the Swedish model, mm -hmm. we have to be absolutely sure about the things that we're saying about it, yeah. and we have to give the hard facts and figures. Mm -hmm. And I was in Sweden like uh, four years ago, and I was really interested. But I also noticed that there weren't very m many hard facts and figures when it came to human trafficking, mm. and also. Uh, okay, um, uh, street prostitution was halved, 
But when I was in uh, Stockholm, I still saw a lot of uh, street prostitution on that one street going on. Well, I'm uh, absolutely not lying to any one of you. I'm talking about facts. Uh, oh, I'm not saying I, that you're lying. I, I do agree that uh, our big evaluation has quite a few years now, and uh, we're, I'm arguing that we should do new evaluation next great. year, yes. That would be great. Because hard fact is, is, uh, is important. But nevertheless, there are a lot of uh, you know, facts showing that we are in a whole different category with our legislation and uh, you know, working uh, for gender equality in the society, putting this in the school curriculum and so on, that really changed the mindset. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm sorry to, to interrupt. We, we don't have any We'll more continue time. outside. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll give the word to Hush Kamau to finish this panel. I'm really sorry about the, the we don't have time. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, after the first part about the shittiness of German laws, we are now coming to the fun part. Um, what does the abolitionist movement in, German, in Germany do? So please give me six more minutes before we all go and grab some pizza. As uh, abolitionists, we view the situation of prostitution in Germany very critically, and we believe it impedes equality between men and women. There cannot be any equality where one sex can buy the other. We see that Germany is being called the brothel of Europe and that Germany, German society is becoming brutalized here. We also see that Germany, together with the Netherlands, has a particular position within Europe as regards prostitution, as laws on prostitution are highly liberal. A few weeks ago, two Swedish journalists visited my town for an interview. It was astounding for me to see that there are men who are shocked at the reality of prostitution in Germany. The two journalists called our German attitude to prostitution extreme, something we never hear from German men. German men only think it's extreme when it comes to abolishing prostitution. Then they are shocked. <laughs> I want to answer the question about what steps we can take by explaining how we as abolitionists work in Germany, what our strategies are, what lines of argument we use, and what our practice is. In 2014, which is also the year in which I began to speak publicly, abolitionists convened for a first time in Munich for an international congress under the motto Stop Sex Buying, Stop Sex Kauf. The association Stop Sex Buying still exists. It is kind of an informal umbrella organization for nearly all action groups, initiatives, associations, and individuals in Germany that are critical of prostitution. We meet in Munich once a year to exchange strategies and actions and to encourage each other. We also have a group on Facebook to keep up to date. Our strategy consists of several points. First, due to the engagement and work by many individuals and by initiatives or associations since 2014, there have been presentations, panels, and smaller conferences and seminars on prostitution in many cities. And we are increasingly invited to present our analysis. This is difficult and slow work, a kind of grassroots revolution, but personally, I have the impression that it has an impact. Nearly every time after one of us has spoken in a city, an informal group of women from this city will come together who will follow up on the topic, who approach their politicians with the issue and who do something on site. Second, our strategy is to critically review and inform the media. Before 2014, German print, TV, and other media almost exclusively portrayed prostitution as something very wonderful. This is something we have successfully changed by not accepting this kind of reporting. So we wrote angry emails and we complained and published counter reports and submitted useful criticism with suggest suggestions with which other experts should have been asked or interviewed. 
This has a positive effect. I'm trying to shorten this. <laughs> Via the media, a change in public attitudes can be achieved. The third strategy is enlightenment, information, and education. This means again and again having to explain key terms. By that I mean to make clear that the Nordic model does not mean a prohibition of prostitution since it, since it, it does not make it illegal for women to prostitute. It is, however, forbidden for punters only, to you said. What also has to be explained over and over again is that legalization is not the same as decriminalization. Above all, that all abolitionists that as abolitionists, we only wish to decriminalize the prostituted woman and not all aspects of the sex industry. For a long time now, we have placed the bias in the focus of our analysis. From our point of view, endless debates on whether a woman is in prostitution voluntarily or not, or if this makes it an independent choice, gets us nowhere. We ask, who are the punters? What do they think about prostituted women and about women in general? And what exactly happens in the brothel rooms? We value the reports by exited women and also review the comments, punters' fright and punters' forums, the online discussion sections about the various brothels in which they evaluate and rate the women in incredibly degrading ways. These forums clearly show that prostitution is sexual violence and whether the woman who prostitutes herself voluntarily exposes herself to this violence or not is no longer the question. Finally, for the last part, I, wa I want to speak of my organization. I believe that the, pers that the abolitionist movement has to be led by exited women and survivors because any change in the laws directly affects us. This is why I founded Netzwerk Ella in January 2018. Currently, we are, all, we are 12 women. All of us either were in prostitution once or are still in it. And this makes us the only association that is exclusively restricted to survivors in Germany. We have a homepage. On this page, we publish various texts on all aspects of prostitution, how we entered, how we exited, what legalization has meant for us, why decriminalization is important, and more. We plead for the Nordic model and see how important it is to keep pointing out that this model does not solely consist of criminalizing the bias, but also of enlightenment, the decriminalization of the woman concerned, and of exit opportunities and valid support. We see it as our obligation to contribute to the effective implementation of the entire Nordic model. And in order to achieve that, I support my colleagues in Netzwerk Ella who want to write texts or who want to give interviews or speak on panels. Thank you. So thank you to all the speakers. I'm sorry we don't have time for the debate. And stay seated for the next panel, which will be about youth promoting social equality. Thank you.